This is Jets FM on EOFN. Jan Levine joining me as always. Jan, good to talk to you again. Same here. We're in. Yes, closer. we are. Thank goodness. A couple more weeks to go, uh, and then we'll have our preseason picks and analysis. And uh, we've been already doing that because we're trying to do the very best to give you as much coverage as we possibly can. Even though we're not down at training camp, we can only get video clips here and there going to the website. But our special guest, Ryan Dunleavy from the New York Post, my co-host on the OFN today, who was down at Jets practice today. And uh, we found, I just thought it was a perfect time to get you on the show, Ryan, since you don't get down to Jets camp too often. So was this your first trip to Jets practice this year? This year, yeah. I, was, I did a little bit of Jets last for the audience. I mostly do the Giants, but made my way over to the Jets today and got this nice little sunburn right here. You Very see nice. Little red strip right there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The sunblock. But yeah, I was out of Jets today. All right. So uh, you're going to be our guest for the next uh, 10 minutes, Ryan. So Jan and I will uh, pump up as much questions as we can over to you. So you were down there. So, uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, press conference, I had an opportunity to listen to the press conference. And uh, you had a, a, an interesting question that I wanted to touch up on anyway. And that was the whole Marcus May deal, because it really does seem like. For the past week or so, there's been a ton of positive uh, news coming out regarding Marcus May, and it seems like he is taking over the the position, the style of play that was on Jamal Adams' plate, and so far so good. Yes, absolutely. He was he made plays. From what I understand, he's been making plays all camp. And look, he's been a playmaker, but this just kind of happens, right? Like. When you're the third or fourth best player on your defense, you just don't get as much attention as Jamal Adams, who's, you know, making more plays and, you know, has kind of a look at me mentality. So people look at him and, you know, you bring in CJ Mosley or Quinn and Williams is a first round pick. The Jets pick a first round defensive player pretty much every year. So somehow Marcus May just gets pushed back and back into the uh, fold and now it's like oh well uh, Marcus May is actually pretty good and you see him making plays and then today Buda Baker gets an ex contract extension a record setting contract extension and you're like wasn't he drafted like three picks before Marcus May and you realize like <laughs> oh the, you know, the, the the Jets you know Marcus May is it's kind of like what is going on with the Giants and Evan Ingram it's like on one hand, you have, oh, this guy is due for a breakout year and looks like he could be poised to really hit it big. And then on the other hand, you're like, well, if he hits it big, we're going to owe him a lot of money. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, you know, catch 22 kind of thing. But it's definitely what you want to see. No question about it. And, and yeah, and the Jets still have some extra cap space, too. So and they haven't decided to use any of it this year. Uh Before Jan steps in, uh one more question, and that does pertain to whether or not you think the Jets will add any name players because Joe Douglas does not, we, we understand he's not going to just throw draft picks away. That's not his nature. So we understand that, but there are some pretty good players that are still left out there. Defensive line players, cornerbacks and so forth. You could even make a trade if you want to, uh, what's your gut tell you when, whether or not there's going to be another impact player and it won't be Earl Thomas that will join the Jets. Now, as you know, I pitched the idea a couple weeks ago that I thought they should go try to give up one of their second rounders for Yannick Nagakwe or one of their, you know, second rounders and a mid rounder or one of their late first rounders from the Seahawks for Yannick. I thought that would be a good fit for the Jets. It won't be Earl Thomas. Uh, there were rumors earlier this offseason that they were interested in Logan Ryan. I think that was probably more just checking in on Logan Ryan, as every team should have been doing. Uh, no, the long answer, the short answer is no, I don't think you'll see that with the Jets. And I don't think you'll see that with the Giants. I don't think you'll see that with either New York team. I just think those are the kind of players, those are the kind of moves that teams that are nine win teams looking to get out to the playoffs or 12 win teams looking to finish off a Super Bowl roster make and Clowney, Logan Ryan, those kind of guys. I don't think if you're the Jets or the Giants, especially with salary cap uncertainty next year, what's it going to be when you can roll over space this year? I don't think I'll handing out a six to ten million dollar contract for a guy who maybe gets you from four wins to six wins is smart business. So I don't think either team's in that stage with their with their uh, current rebuilds. 
So, Ryan, a couple of things. So, first of all, it's funny because um, Greg and I both spoke when Adams was let go that we thought that that May could step into that role and have a bigger role. And it's one of those he and I had both last year said, if we're going to sign somebody early and take a flyer coming off an injury, May's the guy I'd lock up early just for the upside potential. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. So my question, though, is on the offensive side. So Perriman's still out with his knee, hopefully back on Saturday. We know Vincent Smith is out with a lot of questions regarding the receiver crew. Has anybody that you've heard or seen taken a step forward to kind of make us feel a little bit better about this receiving crew, including with Mims being out as well? So I was at practice today, and I actually just wrote the sentence that it was like a fishing town today because there was so much competition for catch of the day. Uh Cager made a ridiculous catch on the sideline. I know my colleague at the post, Brian Costello, is very high on what Lawrence Cager brings. The guy I'm always intrigued by, and he made a fantastic catch today uh, in the back of the end zone, is Braxton Berrios. Uh, I think, you know, I liked him coming out of college. I think if the Patriots drafted him and saw something in him, and we know the Patriots' history with those slot receivers, if they liked him, you should like him, I should like him. They, that's kind of their niche. Uh, I, I like Barrios. I think he's kind of a guy. And look, Darnold throws the ball to Jamison Crowder every play. <laughs> yeah. Like, fantasy owners should yeah. get Jamison Crowder. He throws it to Jamison Crowder every play. I don't know if that'll change when Perriman and um, Mims are back, but, I mean, he's definitely his favorite, car- his favorite target is Crowder. So he's obviously stepped up. We know what he can do. But Barrios is the guy I, I, I really like. I just wonder if they can get Berrios and Crowder on the field together. Like, if they're both slot guys, I don't know what you can do if you're Gase and uh, the OC there to kind of get them. You're not going to go four wide with two slot guys. That's not the Jets' strength. So you're going to have to find a way to get Crowder and Berrios to play to their strengths, I think. So Cage is the guy who Greg knows that I really was high on when they signed him as an undrafted free agent just because without the injury. We both thought he was probably a fourth, fifth round guy with some upside potential. Um, a lot of granted five new guys in essence this year. What, how have they looked? And any questions or concerns from the coaching staff in terms of cohesiveness without a preseason? You broke up there after Cager, so I'll Sorry. take I'll take Cager and then bring it back to me. Uh, bring it back with your question, but yeah. So Cager, of course, yeah, I agree with you. It was probably a mid round pick, and then. Good practice yesterday, good practice uh, a couple days ago. Great catch today. Gives you one of these on the sideline, and then he leaves practice with a knee injury. <laughs> so he might just be one of those guys. You know, like it's obviously it's early, but he might just be one of those guys who is good when he can play, but you're never going to get 16 games out of him. So my question was on the offensive line. So any concern with the coaching staff? Granted, five new guys, no preseason trying to create a cohesive unit and finding a way to keep Darnold upright and, and th- be able to throw the ball. How are they kind of managing that to try to create kind of the environment where they can kind of co- get some kind of cohesive unit quicker? Yeah. I mean, obviously in this COVID area, there's a couple of things people talk about, right? Like young undrafted guys have a hard time without preseason games and new offensive lines and new secondaries, the two positions that really rely on chemistry, the back end and the offensive line hard to gel together. Uh, I kind of think that's overrated, uh, just talking to offensive linemen around the league. I kind of think that's one of those things that's more cliche than it is true. Like, you know, if you're all in the meetings together, if, you all, if you're all practicing together, I don't know how much going out to ribs at night, uh, you know, really helps you uh, open up lanes better. But uh, so, yes, I mean, there is some concern just in building five new guys together chemistry-wise, but it's an upgraded offensive line. And I'll always take talent over, you know, chemistry or whatnot. I'll always take the talent. And they have five better players as a five sum than they did last year. Today was definitely the best running day from the other reporters I talked to, the best running day they had at practice. And it can be hard if you guys have seen a training camp practice or it can be hard for running plays to really stand out in a training camp practice, right? Because the defense kind of knows what's coming. There's no tackling. So you don't really know, did he break that tackle? He got touched. Is the play over? Is it not over? But uh, Lam- LaMichael Perrine, Frank Gore, and Le'Veon Bell all broke out huge runs today. Block, good blocks from Beckton, Lewis, and McGovern all stood out in those running plays. So Jets had a good day running the ball in practice today. Yeah, and I also think it's going to be a little bit harder or maybe take a little bit longer for a zone-blocking scheme 
to work than just, hey, line them up and mano a mano with the line. We're going to power run you to death. When you are in a zone blocking scheme, as you know, Ryan, you got to kind of, it's like a balancing act. You guys got to learn, and not only the line, but the running backs. The linemen have to know the running back style. It, it might take a little while, but like you said, not only is this a more talented unit, they have a very underrated coach in Frank Pollock, and they also uh, are in a situation so far where there's no injuries. That's important. And and Frank Gore has seen every kind of blocking scheme imaginable. Yeah. So and he and he likes to teach. Frank Gore likes to teach. He likes to tell other guys everything. He likes to impart wisdom. So if you're gonna have that situation, it's a good gut got a good year to have Frank Gore on your team. So even Le'Veon probably hasn't seen everything there is to offer. Frank Gore has seen everything there is to offer. So he can uh certainly I think even Le'Veon said yesterday he's learning stuff at twenty nine years old or twenty eight, whatever he is from Frank Gore. So there's Frank Gore can definitely, Hey, this is how you run behind this. This is how defenses play this. And I think he relishes that. All right, I know you got to run. So uh, quickly, a couple of quick uh, questions. One, reg- or just tell me besides the receivers, was there any other particular player, like a sleeper player that just caught your eye? Uh, Oh, I'd have to go through my notes here. Let's see. Uh, today. Oh yeah. Uh, Hairston. I don't know if he counts as a sleeper, but he made a couple of nice plays today. I thought Nate Hairston made a couple of nice plays. The Jets are kind of looking for their how, who's going to start on the outside yep. corner. Who's you know what's going to be their starting rotation in corners. Uh, Nate Hairston made a couple of plays tracking deep balls. I thought was uh, impressive, especially uh, one bless Austin. I think blew the. It's hard to tell, but it looked like he blew the coverage on one side of the field, and it didn't matter because. Harrison ran with the receiver and it was incomplete. So uh, Harrison, I thought, had a pretty good practice. And one neat thing I saw was uh, during a special teams period when offensive and defensive guys are usually getting a drink of water, uh, Quinn and Williams and the defensive line coach Andre Carter spent a couple minutes just doing hand-to-hand fighting, combat, uh, like a one-on-one session for a couple minutes while everybody else was taking a breath, uh, breather, a breather. And I thought that was really important just to see that kind of devotion to Quinnen and Quinnen was uh very 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 laser focused in on what Carter All was right, saying. And the last question quarterbacks uh Mike White got a call out on the press conference today and as soon as he got the call out boy Adam got at uh, the gates his, his eyes lit up and not uh, no pun intended based on his history but he was very impressed with Mike White. It, it Look, it's a much deeper quarterback room. And even without Flacco, that's that's very welcome sight, knowing that Sam Darnold could miss a game or two this year like he has over his first year, over his first few years. Yeah, White was the one who threw the ball. The catches that I mentioned by Barrios and Cager, White threw both of those balls. Uh, he zipped a couple in there. Yeah, you're right. It's an interesting room because you expect – James Morgan will be carried as a third string quarterback uh, on a practice squad because they used a you know mid round pick on him. You expect Flacco's the two and Darnold's the one, so I don't know really where everybody else fits. But yeah, Mike White you know could fight fight his way onto a practice squad or fight his way into the third string uh, job because or second string till Flacco gets back because he certainly. Uh, has caught Gase's eye maybe more so than Fails and uh, uh, who's the other guy in camp? Morgan. Fails and no, there's another. Yeah, yeah, more than Fails and Morgan. Any yeah. last questions, Jan, before we let Ryan go? So uh, Greg and I have talked a lot about special teams. Um, any early favorite between Flicker, Flicker and uh, Maher between the uh, for the kicker? Good question. <laughs> I don't know. It's too hard to tell from one practice. Uh, you know, I hard to tell from today who that would be. I, I would guess it would be Ficken, but I, I honestly, I, that's just a guess. You got That's one of those things you got to be at every practice to track. Graham, we'll give you an example. Graham Gano for the Giants, when he was signed, made his first nine field goals in practice over the first couple of days. And then if you just came yesterday, while well, he missed his only kick, you'd be like, oh, Graham Gano still doesn't, doesn't have it anymore or whatever. So it's hard to do a one-day thing mm-hmm. on the all right, Ryan, thanks a lot. No, you got to run. We'll be talking to you real soon, either later this week or next week on the OFN Today. See you, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. All right, so Ryan Dunleavy, and again, Ryan uh, joins us uh, at least once a week on the OFN Today. We'll have a little bit more of a firm schedule once the season starts, but a couple more weeks, and that includes our show because we'll have 
probably at least two shows a week, if not three shows. A lot's going to depend, obviously, on uh, once we find out when these because I, I just I don't know. It, it's weird, but I still kind of it's not that I don't trust everything is going to kick off on time. It's just with I've been so disappointed by 2020 with everything to do with sports. That's like I just it's, and that's the thing that just drives me crazy about college football is that I kind of want to really get into college football, but every all of my attention's in the NFL because I just I can't trust it's, it's I have a hard enough t- time trusting all the other sports, let alone all the craziness that's going on in college football that I'm going to put in countless research hours on on college football, especially teams. What happens if I would have spent 20 hours last month prepping for the Big 10? I would have just wasted my time. Absolutely. I mean, we are living in, in crazy times. I mean, given the spikes we've seen at USC with schools being back and Alabama with school being back and everything else, it's it's impossible to figure what's going to be right. It's one of those, you know, it's the cliche of rolling with the punches. Unfortunately, right now, given where we all are from a pandemic perspective and, and numbers rising and, and universities trying to figure out what we're doing, if we're having if we're going to have winter football, which did come up today. I know you and I spoke about it before and you were not a big favor, but there is some chatter. Yeah that you could have winter football when it comes to college. It's um, so we, we end up going that direction. Um, again, smoke and fire. Remember that, Greg. We've always talked about that, right? When it comes to trades and everything yeah, else, well. if the thought process is being broached, there is a feasibility that somebody wants. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but still the feasibility exists. Yeah, and look, I, I, there's no, I w- anytime you can put additional football, if it's the, the teams that haven't played in the fall, well, yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. But I'm not going to be suckered in by it because there's no way they're going to do it. I just I've, I've heard all this nonsense before. They're just saying what they want to say. And then they'll because they did the same thing with this entire pandemic. They said as soon as we start getting a, a, you know, a hold on this thing, then everything will open up again. And what happened? Nothing opened up again. So I don't believe anything that they say. Anything. Um, okay. But again, I hope uh, they do. I'm, I'm not going to disagree I'd love with to you. watch college football in January or February. What's what's a joke is is them talking about having it done indoors. Yeah, you guys yep. can't even decide the conferences from conference to conference on what you guys are going to do. But you're going to somehow figure out a way to put what you're going to have like uh, games, like in a bubble indoors at certain stadiums. I mean, they, they, there's just no way am I going to think that they're going to understand how to do that? Because as you know, it takes so much work. You have to be organized and that's nothing like college football. They are completely well, the it's, opposite. It's the NCAA in general. The NCAA. Uh, you know, yes. It's, it's, yes. The, the, the lack of leadership is fairly staggering is probably the best way to refer to it. All right. Now, one of the things that when we were talking with uh, Ryan and uh, he mentioned Cager, and it's good news that not only today, but even in previous days, he's been the one receiver that has definitely stuck out. So hopefully he's healthy. It's just a minor thing. And uh, considering they're, they're not even playing yet, I mean, they're not even scrimmaging. Of course, there's no preseason games. You know, I, I just wonder whether or not we're going to see – uh, an, an increase in injuries across the league when we start playing football. People aren't used to physical contact, right? You can scrimmage all you want, but it's clearly not the same, right? Which is why we've said you may not like the four or five preseason games, but a handful of them make sense to get teams used to contact and being physical. And this is why tackling has suffered over the years, given the understandable decrease in terms of practices with, with, with tackling and hitting. But the problem is there's a downstream impact. And this is going to be the same thing this year. Guys are going to you're going to probably have tweaked groins and hamstring and calf muscles and everything else associated with it because guys aren't used to the physical contact. And until they get used to it, they're going to probably see some guys missing a game here and a game there just as their bodies get reacclimated to, to playing with contact. Uh, also, we've heard some good news regarding Trevon Wesco. Gase has talked him up. He really likes the tight end room. Uh, and why not? especially now that Chris Herndon is so far back to being healthy. You know, Ryan mentioned... Knock on wood. Knock yeah. on wood with that comment. Ryan mentioned going to Jamison Crowder a lot. And I don't I don't think that's a negative. You know, Tom Brady, you know, you had Julian Edelman. And you got a guy that's going to constantly get you first downs. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But I definitely what we what this team needs to see from Sam Darnold, the biggest deficiency he has in his game is he's got to find a way to be more consistent once you get past 10, 15, and even 20 yards down the field. He's not very consistent on his deep passes. And how many times did we see last year in games where a guy would be open? It looked like he was open, and Sam would just not even be close with the pass. So he has got to figure out a way. Because if he if he's going to take that next step and be a an elite quarterback, that has to be part of the package. No question. I mean, one of the things we saw Anderson open several times last year where he either overthrew him or underthrew him. I mean, part of the benefit of hopefully having Perriman was that he would had a similar skill set where he could get deep. We know that Mims has the opportunity and the ability to get deep when he gets healthy. So the fact that both of those guys are out hurts Darnold as well because you don't get the reps. You're not being able to build together in terms of building up a an understanding in terms of the speed associated with each one of those guys to be able to maximize their talent and be able to get deep. You're going to be learning on the fly, which is clearly not the op- optimal. Um you're hoping that the growth that maybe we expect that on a Donald manifests itself, but that's one of those things we're going to have to watch early on as to whether or not he's improved his deep accuracy. Yeah. And uh, as far as Kogan, he's it's not a surprise that he's picked up the offense real quick. He's, he's a veteran. He's been around a while. He's 32 years old. Uh, that's, that's a guy that it, it, chances are, look, Mims at this point, we talked about it last week. I, I I'm not even, going to think about Mims this year. He's, he, if, if, if he finds a way on the field, even by midseason, and, and contributes, I'd be shocked. So anything that he brings now to this team this season is, is gravy. I think it's going to be a, a redshirt year for, for him. So a guy like Hogan is going to end up being real important. And I think a guy, like, especially somebody that I think you can't look at what happened last year. We talked about that as well. Carolina had all sorts of problems at quarterback. That was just a not that was just not a good offense last year. So hopefully this year, a new team, a better team, we hope, uh, and better quarterback play. And Hogan will be the player that, or at least give us a veteran presence that the team desperately needs in that receiving room. And then Cager hopefully can stay healthy too. The running backs, P Ryan. So far, we're hearing some good things about P Ryan. And boy, did Le'Veon Bell look thin in the press conference today. And I know he's lost weight and he says he's in the best condition of his career, but I didn't even, this first time I saw him at a press conference, I'm like, man, he looks different. That's, that's a good sign. Yep. He look, he was the ultimate professional last year in a situation that could have allowed him not to be professional based on the way things went. And we talked about a lot last year, how he was still a leader in the locker room and he clearly has taken on um, that mantra or that, that mantle. Um, again this year, and, but he's also buffeted and benefited from having Gore there who can only hopefully help him in terms of maturing into the type of leader we hope he can be because I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. And also no Williamson so far. Uh, we talked about last close week. though. Yeah. We talked last week close. I think though we talked last week about the jets defense looking more and more like a four, three front, but we'll see a uh, Wasu had this big day. A few games ago, a few days ago in practice, and it, 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 no surprise, it came from covering and making edge rusher type plays. So, that again, I just think a Wasu, that's where he's going to be best fit with this defense. Uh, other than that, Brian Poole's also been out. So, um, I, you know, that looks like to be a minor thing. I'm a little bit concerned with Desir not playing because he hasn't, I don't think he's played in two weeks. And he's supposed to be right now the number one guy outside of pool in the slot. So uh, hopefully we get some of these guys back. There's still a few weeks to go. Hopefully. I mean, there's still a couple of weeks left for camp, right? We still we still have a little bit of time. But the longer it lingers of an injury, as we said, you know, we talked about Mims. But even the veterans, the less of a likelihood of being them ready for opening day or being ready to contribute substantially opening day, which which makes the depth of the roster important. And all the defensive backs that we've talked about being there, they get to take a step up. But clearly you want the guy who potentially could be your number one um, in the lineup as quickly as possible. All right. That'll wrap it up. Jan, we'll talk to you again. And I think next Tuesday might be our last scheduled offseason show. Because the week after that, that's the week the season begins. And then we have to kind of, we might have two more Tuesdays. But we've got to, at some point, we're going to let everybody know what our regular schedule is going to be once the season begins. And then we start prepping for Buffalo. So, Jan, appreciate it. 
Uh, thanks to Ryan Dunleavy as well. And uh, the rest of our week this week on the Orlando Football Network includes I have uh, interviews with the Minnesota uh, talking Minnesota Vikings over the weekend, I believe. Also, uh, L.A. Chargers, Atlanta Falcons, and a bunch more interviews next week. So, Jan, appreciate it. We'll see you next Tuesday. Looking forward to it.